Hi everyone. Today we are going to talk about Strider. This is the part one. In this, we are going to talk about the questions that have been asked previously. Then we are going to talk about epiglottitis, laryngotracheobronchitis. What is the definition of Strider, and what are the types of Strider? Okay. Now coming to the questions. So the, these are the following uh, essays that have been asked in the previous years. How do you manage management of a child presenting with Strider? Again, you can see the way the questions are being asked. How do you manage again manage a seven-year-old boy again a child presenting with Strider? So basically, it's the same kind of question. Third one: How do you manage a four-year-old boy who is brought to you for Strider for a few hours duration for a few hours duration? So it's a short duration. Okay, how do you manage this case? Okay, so these three questions are basically coming from the same thing. So I wondered why this questions is being asked repeatedly. Then I thought if I go according to the textbook and start talking about what is Strider, what are the types of Strider, causes of Strider, and how do you investigate and manage? This is like a general kind of a question, right? General kind of a question. Okay, but here also he is being specific. Child of ten years. Okay, so he is not. He doesn't want the examiner looking from the examiner's point of view. The examiner doesn't want you to write about the congenital causes of Strider. Okay, he is not interested in this because uh, suppose it's a neonate. Neonate means four weeks of age. The the causes will be different. Most common will be laryngomalacia, laryngeal web, uh, subglottic stenosis, uh, such kind of things. Congenital vocal cord paralysis because of birth trauma. Uh, subglottic hemangioma, laryngoesophageal cleft. Uh, so these are some rare causes. Then I thought, what is it? Why is he focusing on a seven-year-old child, a four-year-old child, a ten-year-old child? Then I thought, okay, suppose there is you are you have finished your MBBS and now you are an intern, you are in your casualty, and a child of this age is going to be brought to you. A, a congenital kid that is the first four years of age, uh, first four weeks of age will not come to the casualty because he is born there in the uh, under the under the supervision of a gynecologist, uh, and there is a neonatologist anyhow present. And this is what I thought. What I felt like, so the examiner is mostly asking you to focus on these things. So then I thought, okay, let us first focus on acute epiglottitis and acute laryngotracheobronchitis, which are again important questions. Maybe he is focusing on acute epiglottitis, as we are going to see, which is more common in uh, this uh, this age group. Okay. Acute laryngotracheobronchitis is in much more smaller children. Okay, steeple sign. So let me first complete acute epiglottitis and acute laryngotracheobronchitis, and then let us talk about this one. You know what is Strider? What are the types of Strider? To give you a complete picture of this Strider chapter. The other question, the last essay is this: What are the types of Strider? Clinically recognize them, and what are the causes of Strider? So this is mostly a theoretical kind of question. Okay, these three are what happens in a real life situation. Okay. Now coming to ep acute epiglottitis. Acute epiglottitis. So much of importance is being given. Three essays have been asked. Okay, maybe he is focusing on this. That's what I felt. Acute epiglottitis. Why? Because it's a rapidly progressive. Today you are having. Today the baby is having uh, fever. Tomorrow he is going to have a fatal airway obstruction. So if you say okay, nothing is going to happen to the child, and you send him away. You, the child may even die. Okay, so in the back of your mind, a child of two to seven years of age, uh, who is presenting with rapidly, who is presenting with airway obstruction, always keep epiglottitis in your mind. Keep epiglottitis in your mind. This is what the examiner wants, and this is how I am trying to present to you. Okay, so what is acute epiglottitis? It is rapidly progressive. It doesn't give you much time. Cellulitis, infection of the epiglottis, that can lead to fatal airway obstruction. It is caused by a bacterium. It is caused by a bacterium called Haemophilus influenza type B. I want you to remember because there is something called laryngotracheobronchitis, which also has a similar way of presentation, but it is caused by a virus. Okay. So acute epiglottitis. Again, I want to focus on this part. Rapidly progressive cellulitis of the epiglottis that can lead to fatal airway obstruction. This caused by a bacterium called Haemophilus influenza type B. Do not get confused. Okay. This. Is a bacterium and that is a virus. Uh, okay, and nowadays we have hip vaccine. 
which can uh, uh, which has reduced the mortality and morbidity caused by this acute epiglottitis which is caused by hemophilus influenza type b uh, four to two to seven years is the most common most of the examiner questions are also being focused on this age group okay two to seven years age group now uh, how does the clinical presentation of the child how does the child present to you so you will see that this is an acute onset fever it is a high grade kind of fever fever is uh, there only for one or two days okay and the child is now having inspiratory strider what is strider strider is noisy respiration because of narrowed air passages <laughs> this kind of strider okay so the so there is some obstruction causing you to have noisy respiration uh, but the cry is not going to be muffled the cry or when you talk to the patient the patient can talk the vocal cords are not involved so the patient will have normal voice or normal cry so this is again an important question from the neat pg point of view is the vocal is the cry normal or not in acute epiglottitis acute epiglottitis the vocal cords are not involved so cry and the talk that the voice will be normal and because of this epiglottis here you can see very clearly this is the inflamed swollen epiglottis which is present right behind the base of the tongue uh, it is going to fall backwards when the patient lies down in a supine position causing the uh, snow this uh, strider and also difficulty in breathing to increase in the supine position okay then the patient uh, is going to be mostly in sitting up position you are not the patient if you make him lie down he is not going to lie down okay so he wants to sit sit so that his breathing is more comfortable uh, the patient is going to have odynophagia that is painful swallowing why because there is a bolus of food in the mouth when the when the baby swallows it when the child swallows it the food bolus has to pass over this inflamed larynx to go into the esophagus go into the esophagus so when it is going into the when it is passing through this inflamed larynx then the baby is going to have pain so he is it is going to be so painful that he is going to be drooling of saliva d r o o l i n g drooling of saliva drooling of saliva okay so drooling of saliva so he can't even swallow his own saliva even swallowing saliva is so painful okay so let me again go through with this clinical presentation it is a very acute onset the, the it's an infection so the baby is going to have fever there is going to be inspiratory strider uh, strider because it is involving the epiglottis we are going to talk about the types of strider the, because see this is a normal epiglottis this is a normal it's a leaf shaped structure you can see the vocal cords there's a nice and big glottic thing these are the arytenoids here you see the word the, the entire epiglottis is red dense one and already a tube is in place uh, endotracheal tube okay so what are the things you are going to have you are going to have fever you are going to have inspiratory strider you are going to have uh, difficulty in breathing in supine position more in uh, supine position so baby, baby is going to have shortness of breath there is odynophagia painful swallowing and there is going to be drooling of saliva but the vocal cords are normal so the voice is normal cry is normal okay so these are the clinical uh, presentation of the child want you to remember this properly adult patient can also have epiglottitis but in such patients you have going to have sore throat throat pain and painful swallowing only you are not going to have this difficulty in breathing or dinophagia is going to be there but difficulty in breathing will not be there this is not uh, an emergency uh, presentation in an adult but in a child this is going to be an emergency presentation because of shortness of breath okay why is it happening because the submucosal tissue of a child is more and loose and an adult is less and dense so this is not going to get swollen but in a child the epiglottis is going to get swollen the epiglottis is going to get swollen okay now coming to uh, examination of the child what is it? if you can do an indirect laryngoscopy in this child you are going to see a red swollen epiglottis you can see pooling of saliva in the vallecula okay this is a classic presentation if you look for this will appear like a rising beam appearance on uh, on indirect laryngoscopy on indirect laryngoscopy you know this is how the epiglot uh, this is the vocal cords this is epiglottis this is ri epiglottic fold this is so big it appears as if it is a rising sun appearance rising beam appearance is seen on indirect laryngoscopy x rays are x rays will ray basically give you a very good uh, diagnosis confirming the diagnosis because see this is a normal epiglottis it is leaf shaped and it's so thin okay see this how it is it is a it is a huge huge swollen epiglottis this is called it appears like a thumb so it is called thumb sign it is called thumb sign okay now coming to the management 
okay what is the etiology what is what is causing the acute epiglottitis it is hemophilus influenzae hemophilus influenzae is a bacterium so what is the first line of treatment antibiotics what are antibiotics amoxiclav works very well amoxiclav amoxicillin clavulanic acid works very well or you can go with second or third generation cephalosporins cephalosporins you can go with third or second generation cephalosporins mostly you will go with ceftriaxone uh, plus albactam combination works very well in such cases so you go you do not take a chance you always go for ceftriaxone salbactam iv because this is a case that if you do not act okay you may have death on your hands so you are going to go for the best possible treatment because hemophilus influenza is a bacterium you are going to treat it with ceftriaxone salbactam steroids are given short course of steroids are given because you want to reduce the edema to reduce the edema you are going to give uh, okay if you are suspecting that the, uh, the that the stridor is severe and the oxygen saturation you always check the oxygen saturation right oxygen saturation and it is falling down quite precipitously you you take up the patient you take the patient to the operation theater and you put an intubation you know endotracheal tube intubation is done as early as possible if you are suspecting that the child may end up with uh, respiratory obstruction okay if intubation is not possible tracheostomy you are going to perform a tracheostomy and give an airway to the patient because the disease where is the disease the suppose this is the epiglottis this is the vocal cords this is the uh, subglottis this is the trachea okay this is the cervical trachea this is the intrathoracic trachea you are going to put a, a tracheostomy tube in the second or the third tracheal rings okay so the disease is up here you are going to give a alternate pathway for the air to enter and you are basically uh, overriding you are going you are overriding the situation and you give enough time for the antibiotics and the steroids to act and reduce the edema after that you can remove the uh, tracheostomy but tracheostomy has more morbidity you are creating a uh stoma right which will okay obviously heal but there will be a scar also for the rest of his life so intubation is preferred if you can't do intubation only then you go for tracheostomy okay prognosis this is a rapidly progressive disease be alert when you have a child 2 to 7 year old who is presenting with strider who is having a very short duration and the patient is having respiratory distress strider means there is some uh, noise obstruction a respiratory distress the baby is having respiratory distress always have acute epiglottitis in your mind and the management as we saw acute antibiotic steroid intubation and tracheostomy okay now coming to laryngotracheal bronchitis laryngotracheal bronchitis and acute epiglottitis you know both of them are a little bit similar you have to be a uh, bit alert especially when you are going for neat pg okay now laryngotracheal bronchitis is more common than acute epiglottitis it, it is most common infectious cause of airway obstruction in children this is the most common cause of airway obstruction in children so this is why laryngotracheal bronchitis is very important croup we call it croup it is the most common infectious cause of airway obstruction in children unlike acute epiglottitis it is caused by a para influenza virus so this is looks like you know our uh, corona virus okay Uh, so but this is also a virus okay so this is a virus so uh, that is a bacterium hemophilus influenza this is caused by a para influenza virus once once i say it is caused by virus you cannot have there is no role for any antibiotics in this case okay how do you differentiate we are going to talk about it okay what what are the structures that are involved in laryngotracheal bronchitis you can uh, in the in the in the world in the name only you have larynx trachea and bronchus it is involving the larynx trachea and bronchus so larynx is involved trachea and bronchus first the larynx is involved and then it progresses to trachea and bronchus in the larynx also mainly subglottis is involved initially when the when the uh, uh, obstruction is not so severe you may have an inspiratory stridor but in subglottis you will have biphasic stridor biphasic means the baby is going to have stridor in inspiration and expiration okay so this is what happens in croup can you see this so this is the normal looking epiglottis if you look at it and you say okay the baby is fine but you look at the glottic ching there is absolutely no glottic ching there is uh, no airway at all if you have a close up picture of this you see the subglottis this is a glottis okay Th- that is the that is the space that the glottis that is the only space uh, that we call you know glottic ching glottic ching is very inadequate in this case now what is the pathophysiology behind it croup uh, uh, this is a normal healthy airway 
This is the smooth muscle that is there inside. This is the lumen. Inside the lumen, this is the trachealis muscle. This smooth muscle gets swollen. This smooth muscle is getting swollen here. And so the larynx, the airway is greatly compromised. And that is why this is uh, uh, causing, uh, uh, this is causing airway obstruction in these children. Okay. Now, coming to clinical features. Now, here it is, we don't, for reasons unknown, most com males are more affected than females. Most of the times, laryngotracheobronchitis, it is a male. Okay, here it is the less than three years of age. As they say, six months to three years of age. So, this is a smaller, younger child. Laryngotracheobronchitis, it is a younger child. Luckily, the onset is gradual. So, the, you, will, you will have three to four days or two to three days. Okay, initially the child is going to have fever, then he is going to have a barking kind of cough. With this, basically, you can come to a diagnosis, barking cough. Okay, why is cough present here? Because the larynx, trachea and the bronchus are getting involved. Because the trachea and the bronchus are getting involved, the, the, the patient is going to have cough. And that cough is characteristic. Once you hear that barking kind of cough, you will not forget it for the rest of your life. Okay, then you are going to have hoarseness. In, in uh, acute epiglottic, what I say, vocal cords are normal, so there will be no uh, hoarseness, the cry is normal, but here the larynx is involved, the vocal cords are involved, so hoarseness will be there, and strider, initially it is inspiratory and then biphasic, because this is strider, strider, this is what is going to cause danger to the patient, there is respiratory uh, problem, there is respiratory distress. Remember, there is no dysphagia and no dinophagia. Why? Because there is no, uh, voc the uh, epiglottis is normal. The foot can easily pass uh, above the epiglottis and into the esophagus. So, there is no problem with dysphagia or odinophagia. But in uh, acute epiglottitis, the child is going to have odinophagia and dysphagia. Okay. Now, coming to diagnosis. Again, X-ray makes, uh, diagnosis is made on clinical picture. Uh, by looking at the child, uh, clinical picture, gradual onset of fever, barking cough. The barking cough gives it away sometimes. Barking cough, hoarseness of voice, uh, and looking at his uh, uh, clinical picture fever, all this. You can come to a pretty diagnosis saying that probably the patient is going to have laryngotracheal bronchitis. But an X-ray is a definitely a very good thing. You can get an X-ray immediately. Almost all the centers have an X-ray. In X-ray, you're going to have the subglottis and the upper trachea is narrowed. You can see this. This is the area. Uh, this is the larynx and trachea area. You can see that there is a narrowing here. There is a narrowing here. So this, the, the, the black shadow is always the air and uh, the white one is the with the soft tissues. Okay. So here you can see that the la the trachea, the airway as it is going from the trachea above into the larynx and in the lower in the subglottis area it's getting narrowed. This is a much more better picture, right? Here, here above in the supraglottis area it is good. Larynx it is very much narrowed in the in the in the lower trachea and the bronch in the lower trachea it is normal. So this one they call it the steeple sign because it looks like the steeple of a church. Okay, the epiglottis is normal. So you will have a narrowing of the subglottis and the upper trachea. Narrowing of the subglottis and upper trachea. So, sorry, subglottis and upper trachea is narrowed, looking like a steeple of a church. And with epiglottis is normal. In acute epiglottis, you will have thumb sign. A steeple of a church looks like this. Okay. What is the management of this case? Management is differing from acute epiglottitis. Uh, it is, uh, that is caused by a... Uh, uh, bacterium. This is caused by a virus. So, the management is mostly supportive. Humidification uh, humidification with normal saline, nebulization with epinephrine because epinephrine will cause shrinking and in increase in the size of the airway. Decongestants to increase the size of the airway. Local and systemic steroids to reduce the edema and increase the size of the airway. All of these are functioning towards increasing the size of the airway so that we can prevent intubation or tracheostomy. If you can give intubation, nebulization, decongestants and steroids and maintain a good SPO to the patient in two or three days or three or four days, patient is going to come out of the problem. Are you going to admit it? Obviously, admit the baby. You're going to be under very close watch. But if you can avoid intubation and tracheostomy, that is great because intubation has got its own problems, tracheostomy has got its own problems. But if, if the SPO2 is falling down, if the oxygen saturation is falling down and the patient is having more of respiratory distress, the disease is increasing. Uh, as the days progress, you think of intubation and tracheostomy. Again, no antibiotics as I have already repeated.
Now coming to the uh, strider proper. Now this is where the answer starts. This is where the chapter starts. Till now we were only talking about acute epiglottitis and uh, laryngotracheal bronchitis because this is what the examiner wants you to keep in mind before you enter this topic. What is strider? Strider is noisy respiration produced by turbulent airflow through narrowed air passages. So strider for a ENT PG, it is like, okay, it is always carcinoma larynx. A 50, 60 year old male who had hoarseness of voice, uh, he didn't come, now he's finally ended up with strider. And strider, we always remember this sound. <laughs> So oh, this is like uh, difficult, the, the, the characteristic sound, sound, once you hear a case of strider, you will not forget it. Strider is noisy respiration produced by turbulent airflow through narrowed air passages. So this is a definition and you have to remember it. I'll repeat again. Strider is noisy respiration produced by turbulent airflow through narrowed air passages. Strider, like the word tinnitus, is not a, a diagnosis. It's a physical sign. Okay. That is not a sign, but this is a physical sign. Okay, strider is a physical sign. It's not a disease. What are the types of strider? Types of strider, it's so much of importance is given to this because it helps you in diagnosing the site and therefore the cause. So you can find out the site based on the site. What may be the cause of the strider? You can you can guess. Okay, at the right from the initial stage, strider is divided into inspiratory strider, expiratory strider, and biphasic strider. Inspiratory strider means the strider is present when the patient is inspiring. Expiratory is when the patient is expiring. Biphasic is, is present both inspiratory and expiratory. So any lesion that is present at the level of the pharynx and the supraglottis will have inspiratory strider. So this is what you have to remember. Inspiratory above, inspiratory above, expiratory below. Okay. Intrathoracic trachea, intrathoracic trachea. Uh, and bronchi primary and secondary bronchi patient is going to have expiratory strider so if there is a foreign body here if there is a mass here the, the patient is going to have an expiratory strider if there is uh, you know supraglottic edema why as in acute epiglottitis the patient is going to have inspiratory strider if the disease is there at the level of the glottis like in the case of laryngotracheal bronchitis subglottis like in the trick of laryngotracheal bronchitis and cervical trachea there may be a foreign body you are going to have biphasic strider okay so, uh, the strider is divided into inspiratory strider, expiratory strider and biphasic strider. Inspiratory strider is the above part, the pharynx and the, and the supraglottis. In, uh, expiratory strider is at the level of the intrathoracic trachea, primary and secondary bronchi. Tertiary bronchi, you will have these. Okay? So, tertiary bronchi is not included. There was a very small bronchi, very small airways. You are not going to have a strider, you are going to have these. Okay? Expiratory V's, expiratory strider, the lower airways, the glottis, the uh, uh, subglottis and the cervical trachea, you are going to have biphasic strider. Okay. I want you to remember, know the term stutter, also called inspiratory snoring because in many of the classifications that I went through, they are including uh, uh, adenoids, uh, tonsillar hypertrophy also in strider, but click Clinically speaking, speaking very clearly, uh, strider means it is the larynx uh, and the trachea and the bronchi. That is where you have strider. This is snoring, inspiratory snoring. Okay, when there is adenoid, when there is a when there is an obstruction at the level of the nose, nasopharynx or the oropharynx, a patient with uh, diphtheria can also present with uh, uh, enlarged tonsils causing uh, stutter or inspiratory snoring. Classically, we see in adenoids. Allergic rhinitis also we see some cases, nasal polyps, coenal atresia, craniofacial anomalies like micrognathia, macroglossia, uh, Peary robin syndrome, if you can remember it, otherwise it's okay. Stutter or inspiratory snoring is not strider. It is seen in obstruction very high up, that is nose, nasopharynx and oropharynx, above the level of the pharynx, obviously. Examples will be uh, the adenoids, the nasal polyps, the coenal atresia and craniofacial anomalies. I talked about V's just now. V's is obstruction below the level of the secondary bronchi, below the level of the secondary bronchi. Okay. So, uh, how do we remember after a long time, after six months or something, how do you, we will, we will forget all this. So, how do you remember? So, V's, if you have heard, you put a stethoscope on a patient with bronchial asthma, you are going to have this expiratory V's. The patient is going to have V's only in expiration. 
So um, uh, you can remember that the the areas adjoining the the uh, parts adjoining to the tertiary bronchi or the secondary bronchi, primary bronchi, and the intrathoracic trachea. These things you will have going to have expiratory expiratory strider expiratory strider that is also expiratory wheeze is also expiratory expiratory strider when it is close to those areas okay so this is uh, by this uh, with this we are going to come to the end of this part one of strider where we talked about acute epiglottitis uh, acute epiglottitis probably the examiner wants you to know about acute epiglottitis because of its rapid onset uh, and uh, can cause death of the patient if you are not uh, fast enough. Second one, we talked about laryngotracheal bronchitis, LTP, also called croup, where you will have enough time where, where it is characterized by barking cough. This is characterized by thumb sign. This is characterized by steeple sign on the x-ray. Then we talked about what is strider. Strider is noisy respiration because of narrowed air passages. Uh, because of turbulent airflow through the narrowed air passages. Then we talked about what are the types of strider, inspiratory strider, expiratory strider, biphasic strider, what are the areas where you are going to have inspiratory strider, pharynx and supraglottis. Where you are going to have expiratory strider, intrathoracic trachea, primary, secondary bronchi. Where you are going to have biphasic strider, glottic, um, subglottis and cervical trachea. That is cervical trachea, this, is, this comes under uh, this uh, biphasic strider comes under laryngotracheal bronchitis. Inspiratory strider comes under uh, acute epiglottitis. Okay, so biphasic strider, inspiratory expiratory strider. And then we talked about two signs, two extra words, uh, noisy breathing. Uh, one is stertor, inspiratory snoring, nose, nasopharynx, oropharynx. They also can cause noisy breathing, but it is called stertor. Noisy breathing, wheeze is also noisy breathing, but that is when they but that, that is seen classically in uh, bronchial asthma where the obstruction is at the tertiary bronchi. Okay, thank you for the patient listening. See you in part two of uh, Strider.